Et euh, je vais passer donc la parole maintenant à, à M. Nchouti Manassé, qui est donc ministre d'État aux Affaires étrangères et à la coopération internationale euh, à Kigali. Et euh, je crois que ça, ça s'enchaîne assez bien parce que on voit bien que dans les pays, disons, du, du Sahel et de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, euh, ce qui va probablement être de plus en plus demandé, ce n'est pas tant une aide militaire euh, française, par exemple, sur le terrain, physiquement, avec des soldats, mais c'est une aide aussi en termes de, de formation, d'accompagnement euh, à la formation des, des forces et euh, sans doute aussi euh, de, de, euh, des aspects euh, comme l'appui la aérien dont vous venez de, de parler. Or, il se trouve qu'il y a un pays euh, africain euh, qui a acquis euh, dans ces domaines une expérience incontestée, euh, qui est le Rwanda, qui a déjà joué un rôle que tous les analystes des relations internationales ont, ont remarqué au, au Mozambique, et qui, euh, à ma connaissance, discute aujourd'hui précisément avec le Bénin en particulier, pour, pour voir comment il pourrait hein, jouer un rôle d'appui, d'accompagnement, euh, plus généralement aux bénéfices de l'Afrique. C'est-à-dire aider un certain nombre d'États africains à céder eux-mêmes, eux si je puis présenter les choses ainsi. Voilà donc euh, la question, et donc je passe maintenant la parole à M. Manassé. En oh anglais, mais j'espère que j'ai été traduit euh, dans un meilleur anglais que... Que, que mon anglais naturel. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Mr. Thier, and um, esteemed uh, participants. Now, first of all, um, what's the situation in Sahel? What's the situation? As of course, my colleagues have put across, it's a very dangerous place to be right now. It's a dangerous place. Now, dangerous because, of course, of the violent extremism that, by the way, is not only limited to Sahel, but goes beyond that region. And of course, if you're not careful, it's going to be exported across the borders. Extremism have no boundaries. They have no borders. No I mean, they have, of course, a region, but they're extremely versatile. And uh, I think we need to look at them as they are sometimes defined them by academic standards, but we don't understand what we are talking about, except when we are affected by the extremism. And so these extremists, of course, um, have implications, as I mentioned, to Sahel and beyond. They have, of course, political implications, economic and indeed social uh, instabilities. They completely destroy the environment in which they operate. They destroy the whole environment in which they operate. Now, um, of course, for one, and we, we have been in this business for more than 14 years, uh, and when Rwanda took up this type of assignment, it was out of our own country philosophy. Indeed, uh, a policy that was born out of the uh, past, genocide, as all of you know very well, And we said we are going to help not only our Serbs, but our brothers across the borders where there are threats or security problems. It's a commitment of our country, not only to the continent, and we have done that beyond our continent. Because we know the consequences. We have borne them, we have felt them, we have read them. Some of us were born in those environments, so we actually know what they are. And so, The situation in Sahel, uh, much as is a terroristic uh, environment, uh, has one issue that we need to, to be alive to. It lacks integrated and coordinated security development approach. I think my colleagues have put a close. We lack integrated, coordinated approach to the problem. By the way, these terrorists are coordinated. You hear them in Mozambique, Sahel, DRC, sometimes in the Middle East, and they, and they are coordinated. But we are not coordinated. We are not coordinated. They have an upper hand in coordination. We don't. At least that's experience of Rwanda. And I tell you, 
uh, shortly what we have learned as a country. And what's missing, if we are not coordinating what's missing, and I'll tell you what's missing. First of all, in the Sahel, we have neighbors. They are not coordinated. I think my colleagues have put a clause. You have coordinated threat, coordinated uh, terrorists, killers, but the states are not coordinated to address the problem. So begin from there. So there's no coordination. And also, because of that problem, we don't have a corrective approach. It's like, it's in this country, it won't reach to me. No, that's a wrong assumption. It's at point X, but tomorrow it will be point Y, the extreme neighbors type. And so, we need to have a coordinated and a creative approach to the problem, not to be indifferent that is in country X, it won't come to country Y. That's a forest. That's a forest. Uh, then, of course, the problem is we should not define this problem only by military means. That's completely a forest. We should not address it by military means. Why? This problem has root causes, has root causes. And of course, some of root causes, I'll tell you, are governance. Governance, absence of governance, is a fertile ground for ex extremism, terrorism. Our experience as a country in Rwanda has informed us that when you have absence of government, there's another government in place, and this is extremism. So we need to address the issue of governance in, the, in what we call extremist areas. Because the absence of government means another, another government that unfortunately is havoc to everybody. Number two, service delivery. Because of lack of governance, there is no service delivery. People don't have the essential services. These terrorists come in to address that problem, that missing link, that missing state. We are going to give you the services. Of course, they don't. Then, of course, there are social economic issues that the government cannot address, and that's a fighter ground for terrorism. Again, this comes in place. And uh, unfortunately, uh, cooperate with, with what I've said up, uh, there is financial incapacity, financial incapacity and time response to a problem. We normally are too late to respond to a problem. We have a problem in the country X, but our response takes, takes time. Takes time. But of course, when we take more time, the problem becomes an even a bigger problem. And I tell you what, we have even a bigger problem. We have a problem of those who have the means, but lack the will. Those who have the means, but lack the will. And those who have the will, but lack the means. So we have a problem here of those who have the means, but don't have the will when the problem is reaching them tomorrow. I don't know when. And those who have the will, but don't have the means. So we need to have a, a, the mismatch. We need to bring the mismatch off. We try to match the two. Those who have the will and those who have the means have to come to the table. Because the problem is a common problem. It's an international problem. And so our experience in Rwanda has informed that there's a mismatch between those who have the will and those who have the means. So we have to be coordinated again in that, uh, in the, in that issue. Now, um, of course, all of us are members of UN. They are member, we are members of UN. But our experience in Rwanda informs us that the, the response of UN to these problems is most times ineffective. And more time, more, mostly, in, I mean, it cannot give us results when we need them. And I tell you why this is happening. In Rwanda, if I tell you our experience of our country, uh, we have had commitments, of course, to help Sahel, and as a country, we want to do that. Uh, under the umbrella of African Union Fund, we have come on board to do that. And of course, support the effort of the um, uh, G5 to eradicate terrorism in Sahel. It's a commitment of our government to do that. And uh, this commitment is not simply 
uh, I hear say, no, when Rwanda commits, it commits. We commit ourselves to solve the problem and actually do solve the problem. And I tell you why we have tried to succeed most times, because one, we analyze the problem. We analyze the contextual pro where, why the problem is there. And how do we respond to the problem? And I'll give examples of two of our interventions. There are very many in the world. Let me begin by Mozambique. Mozambique, in 2021, you know what happened. The terrorists had taken over Cap Delgado, completely a province, three times my country, the size of my country. And so, the uh, uh, officials of Mozambique said, Rwanda, come and give, and give an, a hand. And of course, we intervened. We first of all sent in a thousand troops. It was not enough for that problem. We sent another thousand. Now we have 3,000. And uh, here, we intervened to sort, sort of a problem that had been there and had grown to a bigger problem sooner could be even much bigger than we thought or we could have. I'm not saying the problem is over, but at least for now it's contained. So I think what I'm trying to put across is that the intervention has to be timely when the problem has taken place. Number two, it must, it must understand the context of the problem for us to intervene effectively. I'll give you the second example where our country has intervened, Central African Republic. Central African Republic. This country in, in 2020, it was gone, completely gone. They were supposed to have elections that could not have happened. Uh, I'm not trying to boost. If I had not happened, there was no election. And so, we had again the presence of UN. With, of course, as you know very well, the intervention mechanism which has to be approved in New York. Uh, they intervened, but again, not effectively. So the government of Central Africa approached the government of Rwanda, a government, and we had to send a parallel force. We have one force under UN, which whose hands we, we are bound, to not intervene when terrorists uh, were causing havoc. And another force that was very mobile, that was mobile. And this force has, was able to contain the situation, and we had elections in Central Africa. So far, so good. But of course, the question is, these are intervention mechanisms, successful as they are, are they sustainable? Because I would say only if, again, we are coordinated as international community. If we are coordinated to see the problem as international, not country-specific. And uh, here, I must admit that Sometimes bilateral engagements are more effective than bilateral, but the two can work together. You can have a brand of the two. The bilateral engagements can be effective because we respond in time to a problem we understand. The bilateral takes time, <coughs> sometimes with bureaucracy, when the problem is not bureaucratic. And so we need to have a brand uh, of the two interventions. More importantly, as we try to intervene, one thing we must address or understand is the political, historical context of the problem. We don't simply cut our guns and go wherever. No, 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 no. Back home, we try to understand the problem. What is political, historical context of this problem? By the way, if we don't, we don't intervene. That's our policy. If we don't understand the problem, we don't intervene. And I can tell you here that in our interventions, whether in Mozambique, in the Central Africa, not a penny has come from international communities, being the government of Rwanda, literal finances. We have not paid a, a dollar by anybody. I've done that out of our own relation. Of course, uh, we appreciate what the EU has done. They are trying to foot some of the bills in Mozambique. Uh, our intervention has been expensive, as you may imagine. Uh, but that is our political commitment to help our brothers and sisters uh, on the continent. And so understanding the context is very important. Most times we understand, we address the consequence, not the cause of the problem. We address the consequence, not the cause. If we don't understand the cause, we simply run around without getting a solution. 
So I think in Rwanda, we first sit down and say, what's the cause? What's the root cause of the problem? Then we intervene to address the root cause. And so um, our contribution is alive and uh, well. Of course, as I mentioned, we need to be coordinated. It has to be corrective, and it has to be in time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this, uh, this viewpoint from uh, Rwanda to the uh, problems of uh, the Sahel and West Africa is extremely important and is interesting. Uh, <laughs>